Okay, we're gonna get started. Thank you so much for joining us today on World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. So glad we're able to hold this space, even just for a few minutes. We don't anticipate that this will take a full hour, probably more towards 30 minutes, but we are so excited to see you. And I am especially happy that on the line with us today, we actually have Diana Eugene, who has been a long-term friend of Lifeway Network, serving as a host community member, actually for seven years. So I'm gonna have her introduce herself in just a second, but the theme for today is actually victims' voices lead the way. So more about that in just a second, but just as a recap for anyone who is not familiar with Lifeway Network or new to the community, Lifeway Network was founded in 2007 with first a purpose of educating the general public on issues of human trafficking related to human trafficking, as well as educating our house internally, our staff, our leadership team, and also creating different resources and specialized curriculum for professionals in various fields so that they are better equipped to identify human trafficking and better support survivors. The second part of Lifeway's mission is providing long-term safe housing to survivors of human trafficking of all forms of human trafficking under the general umbrella, including safe house, um, including labor trafficking, sex trafficking, and organ trafficking. And then our final program is for alumni residents. It's called WINGS, and we piloted it right before the pandemic started. So that's a little bit about Lifeway Network. And as you can see on the screen, here's a depiction of a day in the life at some of our safe houses. So according to the UN, uh, the theme for today highlights the importance of listening to and learning from survivors of human trafficking. Survivors are key actors in the fight against human trafficking. They play a crucial role in establishing effective measures to prevent this crime, identifying and rescuing victims and supporting them on their road to rehabilitation. Many victims of human trafficking have experienced ignorance or misunderstanding in their attempts to get help. They have had traumatic post-rescue experiences during their identification interviews and legal proceedings. Some have faced re-victimization and punishment for crimes they were forced to commit by their traffickers. And actually we have a take action that pertains to that part a little bit later. And others have been subjected to stigmatization or received inadequate support. And in relation to that, Dr. Countryman Rossworm, who actually is a survivor of human trafficking herself, cautions against how certain professionals tend to partner with survivors. So she says, as multidisciplinary professionals and concerned citizen groups struggle and compete to secure the name recognition, status, and finances that will support their continued efforts, they look to and encourage survivor leaders to tell their stories to local and national media outlets to community donors at large fundraising events and in the name of re-election during political campaigning. In the name of offering the public an inspiring story that will assist in the garnering of resources to support continued rescue efforts, survivor leaders are utilized as stars. However, they are rarely genuinely lifted up, respected, treated as equal partners or supported and followed as competent leaders. So in light of that insight, uh, Diana and I conducted an interview with a former Lifeway resident, and we wanted to have certain considerations in mind. So um, the beauty of this interview actually was that, first of all, Diana speaks Spanish and the resident was Spanish speaking. And what you'll find, for instance, in research studies, for example, is a participation bias that there are certain people that might be more likely to participate in a study and they are systematically different than those who might not participate. They might have more time, they might be researchers themselves, so they opt into those types of opportunities. But then because of that, you won't hear the perspectives of everyone. And I find the same thing with um, 
how survivors get selected for these opportunities. And sometimes they might not get selected to participate in, um, in an interview, for instance, because they don't speak English. So I was happy we were able to accommodate that so we could have a diverse perspective at the table. So some considerations for this interview was one, before conducting the interview, we offered transparency about the purpose of the interview and how exactly the interview would be used. As much as possible, we tried to offer flexibility in terms of how to best proceed, whether she actually wanted to attend today. Um, we ended up uh, doing the interview with her privately and she preferred that we shared the insight. Um, we skipped question, or we actually gave her the ability to skip questions if she needed to. She didn't actually skip any of the questions. Um, and if she needed to stop at any point, we were willing to accommodate. Those were some of the areas in which we were flexible. Um, the third is, as I mentioned before, the interview was conducted in Spanish and then Diana translated. And particularly Diana has been with us for a very long time. And the resident hasn't been with LifeWay Network for quite some time, but Diana has maintained that relationship. So it wasn't as if this interview was conducted with a complete stranger. Um, the fourth was we resisted probing or looking for certain answers. And five, we didn't focus on the trauma at all, her trauma experience. As you'll see in a second, we'll actually read the questions that were asked to her and avoided sensationalizing the issue. But before I get into the actual interview part, I would love for Diana to introduce herself and actually explain what a host community member does in the ecosystem of LifeWay's work. So Diana, take it away. Let me just make sure that you're unmuted. Perfect, it looks like you are. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diana. I've been with LifeWay for seven years. Um, my role at LifeWay is to accompany the women on their journey to recovery in any and every way possible. Um, they just let me know what is needed and I make sure that I am as present as possible um, for them. And we just work together and try our best to meet their needs. Perfect. Okay. So the questions that Diana asked to the former resident was first to tell us about herself. Two, what does her life look like after LifeWay? What was her favorite part and memory of LifeWay Network? The fourth was to address the challenges faced when attempting to receive help from professionals and how professionals in various fields such as law enforcement, legal, and the healthcare industry can avoid re-victimization. And from her perspective, how would she suggest the public take action? So I'll read her insights. Okay, so first, tell us about yourself. She said, good afternoon. My name is Y. We shortened her name for privacy. I'm a mother of three. I came to America looking for a better life for my children and my family. And after LifeWay Network, She's a caregiver for her cousin's children. The next was you resided at LifeWay Network. What was your favorite part about LifeWay? She said, my experience at LifeWay was very beautiful. The community gave me a lot of love. I met very good people, very loving, affectionate, and very understanding. Many people supported me when I needed it the most. The community was always there for me. When I couldn't go to sleep at night, the sisters would stay up with me. I met some religious sisters that encouraged me to keep moving forward and with love. I was able to regain my strength that I felt I had lost. The next question was if she could address the challenges faced when attempting to receive help from professionals and how can professionals in various fields avoid re-victimization? She said that, she, that I experienced a lack of communication. When trying to get some orientation about where to go to get some help, some were unable to support me. This led me to, this led me to feeling stressed out and anxious. I needed to go to a physician because I was not feeling well, but I was not able to get any assistance. Most importantly, I needed to get a mammogram. I have lost two siblings to cancer 
but I could not get anyone to help me schedule an appointment with a physician that accepts patients that are undocumented and have no health insurance coverage. I have had to do many things on my own without receiving proper guidance and did not always know how to navigate the system. I am still learning. I have the absolute support of my lawyers and counselors. They have helped me and supported me a lot. I really feel supported by them. Um, and then lastly was from your perspective, how would you suggest the public take action? And I think her next section um, applies mostly to people with direct access to survivors. So that could be volunteers at the safe house. It could be mentors for our wings program. And I think this even applies to the way that we speak to survivors. So she says, it is important to have good communication with the survivors. Provide the survivors with love, support, and tools necessary and guidance so that they can learn to fly on their own. Show them understanding, give them encouragement instead of being dismissive. Some of the people that are supposed to be working with survivors, for example, volunteers, employees, treat them as if they are not important. But there are those that are loving, understanding, and compassionate. They try their best to help uplift survivors. The survivors know who those people are and are thankful for them. Please do not treat the survivors with indifference. It is hurtful. So Diana, since you were the one that actually conducted the interview, I was there, but you were doing most of the heavy lifting. Um, what stood out most to you? And I know you've also known her a long time, so I'd be curious to know um, what resonated with you. Um, what stood out the most to me is um, some of the things that we take for granted, for example, just being able to be there for the person, um, letting them know that they are cared for, or some of the things that, um, you know, we just don't understand. At times, it's not anything that is so major that is needed. Sometimes it's just being present. Sometimes it's letting them know that you are here for them in the event that they need anything. And sometimes it is there being in the same space as them, but being quiet and observing and for them to just know that there is somebody there that they can speak to. I feel like at times we take certain things for granted. We just assume that um, they probably need something more out there. Sometimes it's really just the simplest things, the things that we are accustomed to. But um, we have to be mindful that some of them don't have family members here. So um, some of the employees, volunteers are the closest things that they have to the family. Absolutely. That was what resonated for me as well. I actually, when we first asked the question, I kind of expected that she would speak more to maybe some of the activities like the field trips, the gardening. And it was because I was looking at it from my perspective, what stood out to me. But really what she didn't take for granted was the model of life when she spoke to that of how important it was even when she couldn't sleep at night and someone was there to comfort her. And that could be important for almost anyone going through a very difficult time, whether that's a death in the family, a terrible breakup, addiction, someone that's there, multiple people that are there in fact, to say, hey, I noticed something different. You look down these days, how is it going? Those who can sympathize with you and so maybe all of us need that really, that kind of space. And you're right, a lot of, um, not a lot, but some of the survivors we take in, sometimes they're foreign born and might not have a community here. And that's just a basic need that almost everyone has is um, friends, a network, family, someone that they can rely on for everyday stuff. So that also stood out to me as well. And I was also wondering what might you do differently after reflecting upon this interview? I think I will continue to be present for the resident, but I've learned that sometimes when they say that they are okay, and I, I want to meet them wherever they are at, I give them that space. But I would go back and check in and say, do you want to speak? Like, do you want to have a conversation or just go for a walk? And if I'm told no again, I just step back. But I think like maybe I should just keep trying a little bit more um, to make sure that they really know that they are supported and that there's someone there 
to help them in the event that they need um, anything at all. Because sometimes it's just they don't want to bother people. So I will make sure that they know that it's never a bother. Like it's an absolute privilege for them to accompany them on their journey. So whatever they need. Yeah, and she even spoke to one of her challenges being that at one point she wasn't able to navigate the system to get um, testing. And, you know, sometimes the survivors interact with so many different organizations, different professionals at different parts of their journey. And throughout all of that, she struggled with that um, to find one person. So one person can really make a difference to go out of their way and I think you've done a wonderful job of supplying that presence. And also that um, that part had me reflect about my work as an educator, because first and foremost, if one, the knowledge that staff has is really important so that they're best able to support the survivor in whatever the need might be, um, but also just internal cohesion as well, because even if there isn't a literal argument, if there's tension, um, that definitely can be picked up on and it might not feel uh, that secure to someone who's receiving services um, to see that they're not in the best hands. So something that we've tried to do in the education department since we do um, provide education internally as well is not just focus on updates about human trafficking advocacy and human trafficking topics, but also supply education in trauma-informed care and also nonviolent communication, which is an approach we've all really appreciated um, because even though it has the word violence, it's really about how we communicate with one another so that we're not causing more harm or um, can communicate to get a more favorable outcome so that, um, so that's been really helpful as we practice that. We practice it as a leadership team weekly by doing a quick uh, meditation. And then we talk about how to apply it. We do different activities. I've worked with some of the safe house staff, including the house managers on practicing. It's really an approach for every single person. Um, and I think that's important because the, most, the more strong we are in our knowledge um, and as a team, then we are in a better position to support survivors. And I think also it's it's sad that she wasn't able to um, get support in that specific issue that she had. But I think, you know, it's normal for a staff member to maybe, or host community member, whoever it might be in that person's life, to not know the answers to everything. But I think just taking the time to really explore that and say like, let's find that out together even if it's outside your, if you think it's outside your pay grade or it's above you or outside of your wheelhouse, it's, they need your support at the end of the day. And I think that's critical to LifeWay's work, especially because uh, we work so closely with other organizations and we have MOU partners that will supply services that we don't provide in-house and they'll send uh, the survivors to receive long-term safe housing. So it could be really easy in those partnerships to be like, okay, well, talk to that organization. And the organization might be like, talk to Lifeway. Um, but really knowing that the survivor is in your care. So um, you have to have a warm handoff, at least if you it's beyond your capacity, at least make sure that they're connected to the right person. So I think that's really important as well. So thank you so much, Diana, for taking the time to, one, do this interview, the logistics, and provide some of your insight from the last seven years. I think it's really, really important to have that perspective. Um, thank you very much, Tori, for having me. And just to clarify, um, the survivor was speaking about another organization. I mean, we did omit. Um, who she was speaking about, but she has a case manager from another organization that could not help her um, schedule that appointment. I did place calls to hospitals to make sure because she had some ongoing issues and we realized that she needed to eventually speak to someone in the position of authority to get that done for her. And she was able to go through her counselor who has been being able to get her the help that she needs. So she will soon be getting that mammogram. 
Absolutely. And that is a, um, all those details are provided in the blog post, which I'm going to mention right now. We have her transcript from this interview. And what it mentions is that um, although we kept the substance of the interview, we did omit any kind of privacy um, related concerns. And that includes any um, names of like other organizations that she may have mentioned, her own name, um, but we kept the idea of it. So um, we didn't mention which organization she was talking about. Absolutely. Um, but we are excited to have that in that format so that those who couldn't be on the call today can still read it and we can still continue to reflect on that insight. So we will uh, post that blog post probably in the next week or so, which is exciting. If you don't already subscribe to our alerts, please do so on our website at lifewaynetwork.org. As I mentioned before, uh, sometimes not only are survivors not looked to as leaders, but they're also unfortunately prosecuted for crimes that they either didn't commit or they committed, but because they were trafficked and didn't have complete control over their situation, they were compelled and forced to commit a crime. So we're trying to urge Governor Cuomo right now, since the START Act has passed in both the New York State Assembly and the New York State Senate to pass this important bill, which would allow survivors of trafficking to vacate crimes that they did not commit. So please send out a letter, a tweet, urging Governor Cuomo to please, please sign this important bill. And then lastly, as alluded to in her, in the residents challenge about how we need to continue to support residents, um, we want to make sure we're able to support our current residents, get to their appointments, whether that's a medical appointment or a legal appointment, and not just send them off to figure it out and navigate the system on their own. So we are trying to secure a van, and you can help us secure that van. So we will drop a link in the chat, whether that's $5, $20, it goes a long way. And we appreciate those of you on the call who have already provided that donation. That's a wonderful way to take action on this World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. So with that, I'm going to leave my email address right here. Please feel free to contact me at any point. And I hope that we were able to provide you with some insights to reflect on today. So on behalf of everyone at Lifeway Network, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, you as well.